round of applause for DJ Bushu, always. Uh, so hopefully no, uh, everyone listened to me at the beginning of the semester and said that all this crypto stuff and blockchain stuff is a scam and, and that you divested in your holdings before things caught on fire. You're doing okay. Yeah, you haven't heard anything, right? From uh, my yeah. ex. Yeah. My ex. Oh, your ex? Yeah, no, they haven't bothered you or anything? No, I, they haven't come to my office, so yeah. Well, I think I'm in the clear, though. But they were in the crypto I, they said, they were talking about like Ethereum or something. I. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. FTX, have you heard of that? Of course, yes, yeah. That's all on fire. Okay, yeah, it's all a scam. All right, uh, for you guys, let's talk about real stuff. Um, so Project 3 is due tomorrow, uh, again, at, at midnight. Project 4 will be out probably tomorrow morning, uh, and that'll be due on Sunday, September 11th, uh, near the end of the semester, or at the end of the, end of the semester. Uh, and then we'll be having uh, the Zoom session, the Q&A session, actually this week, this Thursday, because... Next week's the holiday, uh, and we want to do it sooner rather than later, right? So the project write-up will be out today, tomorrow. I'll discuss it at the end of class on Thursday, and then we'll have the Q&A session, which, again, will be recorded on, uh, on Thursday as well, okay? Any questions about Project 3 or Project 4? All right, uh, and then for the spring semester, for those of you that really love this stuff, uh, again, I'm not teaching it. Charlie will be teaching it, teaching the course next semester. Uh, but if you want to be involved in it as a TA, uh, we'll post on Piazza how to sign up and, and, and reach out to him and talk, talk about it. I have a question. Yes. This is not a registration week, so I was just wondering, um, what, what's, what, who should take your, your advanced database class? The question is, who should take advanced database class? I think it says in the write-up, anybody with dirty database skills, right? Like, I mean, what do you want me to say? Everyone. I mean, like, if I, I yeah, I mean, what, what, what do you want to say? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so another way to think about it, so in the, in the intro class, we're spending a lot of time on transactions, concurrency control, and so forth. Um, and I've sort of talked or mentioned that, oh, yeah, there's these things called, you know, analytical systems, the column store stuff. I've sort of sprinkled some of that, that language in the semester, uh, but that'll really be the focus uh, in, this, in the fall, uh, sorry, spring semester in the advanced class would be how do you actually build, like, a modern... Uh, high performance analytical database system. Now, we're going to, I think we're probably going to be using Postgres for the projects, which is not high performance or analytics, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. But anyway, th if you want to get, you take the advanced class, we could also, I also recommend you come be a TA uh, next semester if you're not graduating. Okay? And again, no rust, all super fuzz. All right, so uh, the last class we were talking about database recovery, and we were talking about specifically the things the system's gonna do while, while you're running transactions, while they're updating the database, all this extra you know, right ahead log entries we're gonna add that we're gonna use to figure out what happens when there's a crash and how to put us back into the correct state, right? So today's class is now, okay, if there is a crash, how do we go back and look at that log uh, and our checkpoints and figure out what was, what was going on at the moment of the crash and, pot it and try to put the system back into, or we have to put the system back into a correct state. Again, I'm not saying all my lectures are easy or hard, it's hard to rank them, but this is probably the, the third hardest one to deal with or to understand. So like the, the optimization's difficult, the uh, concurrency, control, concurrency control stuff is tricky. This is probably the, the third hardest one. Um, and so I'm gonna try to be very slow and deliberate uh, as we talk about things as we go along, just because obviously this is super important this is the whole reason why we tell everybody you should not be just writing your own database by hand and writing files on disk uh, in your application. You want to be using a database system because this can provide you this, uh, you know, this recoverability and durability guarantees. So th this class is really the whole enchilada. Say, how do we actually uh, you know, achieve that promise? Okay. So the technique that we're going to go through uh, is going to be a high-level summary of something called Aries. Um, and Aries says for algorithms for recovery and isolation exploiting semantics. I think the textbook probably mentions this. Um, and so this was a very influential paper written by uh, some famous database people at IBM in the early 1990s. Uh, and it's going to be the, they basically codified the, the rules for how you actually want to achieve reliable uh, recovery in, in a database system or disk-based database system. So I'll say that not all database systems are going to implement exactly what uh, what the, the Aries paper talks about. This paper is also 70 pages. It's very long. It's very laborious. Uh, 
And so I don't recommend reading it. The textbook is, is a summary. This will be a summary as well. But we're just going to sort of, sort of hit the high, the, the, sort of the major points that you have to do or the steps you have to do to achieve reliability. This paper goes on much more, much more detail about low-level semantics of DB2, or sorry, low-level internal data structures in DB2 that we don't need to cover. Um, but like the compensation log records, the, the fuzzy checkpoints, all that was defined here, and we'll, we'll describe what those are as we go along, right? So basically say like, this paper will tell you exactly how to do it. There are some things you can maybe potentially relax and not do all of this in, in some systems and still achieve the reliable recovery uh, that, that, that we're trying to achieve today, right? So th this lecture is really sort of a condensed down version of, of this original paper. There's a Wikipedia article about it, uh, which maybe get, shows that it actually has some no notoriety um, if you want to go for the detail, all right? All right, so the, the main ideas that we're going to have in Aries are the following. The first is that we're going to rely on the write-ahead log to use to record all the changes that transactions are making to the database during normal processing, right? Uh, and we said that the, the write-ahead, any entry, any update to a page in the database has to have a corresponding write-ahead log and that entry, and that write-ahead log entry has to be flushed to disk before we're allowed to flush the page that it modified to disk. Right, so we always write out the log entry to, to, the, to the disk first ahead of the dirty page, right? And this is going to be relying on the steel no force policy. So steel says we're allowed to write out dirty pages from the buffer pool before a transaction is allowed to commit. But again, we have to write out the log entry first. And then no force says we don't require the database system to flush out all the dirty pages for a transaction when it commits, right? We're allowed to do this at some later point. But again, the log records have to be flushed out. So that's what we're going to do uh, normally why we, why we execute, uh, execute queries. Checkpoints aren't required. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss checkpoints again today. But checkpoints are a way to, uh, to, to reduce the amount of log we have to scan upon recovery. Right? It's basically a way to say, I don't need to go past this point in my log entry, or my log, right hand log, because I know that things are been flushed before this. Right? But it's not required. Yes? So why do you say must, must use still plus no force? Can't you just this question is why do you, why must you use steel why do you have to use steel no force why can't you use no steel no force steel and force uh so this question is why am i saying it has to be steel no force why can't it be steel and force so steel seems you're allowed to flush things out before they, they exist uh before they're written a disk and then no force means again you don't have to require all the dirty pages to be flushed out yep. like you could do force. It's less efficient. It's less efficient because you're just like you're flushing out like you're requiring that you flush out all the log records and now you're requiring you flush out the dirty pages. Yeah. You only need to flush the log records. I mean, from, correctness from a correctness point, it would be still be correct, but like okay. it, you wouldn't do it. Right. Okay, so that's what we do during 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 normal operations. Then over crash when we need to recover, uh, the the another big sort of key idea is that we're going to repeat the history or replay the changes that were made to the database system on recovery uh, by replaying essentially the log records that, that we saw, right? And that's the goal here is to put those database back to the exact state it was at the moment that the system crashed based on what we see was, is in the log. Then we're going to go back and reverse any changes from any transaction that did not commit before, before the crash. But the key idea here now is that we're also going to, when, when we do, when we reverse those changes, we're now going to add new log entries to say, here's the changes we're reversing. And what that's going to help us with is now if we crash and start recovering, but then we crash during recovery, we would then look at our log and be able to say, what were we doing during the recovery? All right? This is going to keep us in a consistent state or correct state, even if we keep crashing over and over again during recovery, which can happen if, if you have bad disk. Okay? Okay, so th these are the three key, three key ideas. So today we're gonna again we're gonna, we're gonna go over the log sequence numbers. That's gonna be the, the key idea of how we keep track of what wrote to what and when. Um, and then we're gonna go through how to do the normal and commit abort operations again while we're running transactions normally or rolling them back using the log sequence numbers. Then we'll in introduce fuzzy checkpoints because that's gonna allow us to then uh, handle the case of of being able to take a checkpoint without blocking everything. And then we'll finish up with actually what, what are the three phases during the recovery process. I'll say also too that this is going to seem 
oftentimes that we're being uh, wasteful or redundant in how we're writing records out the disk and flushing things. Um, and I say that's by design because we want to be super careful, super cautious, and very conservative in how we write things out. Um, and so there'll be some optimization we can apply. Like if I'm doing recovery, maybe I don't flush 30 pages immediately because I'm not really running a transaction or just in recovery mode. But the original Aries paper was very, very like flush here, flush there. Uh, because again, you don't want to lose data because people, people, people would notice and people would get pissed, right? There's some ob obvious optimizations we can do as we go along, but we'll, we'll keep those till the end. Yes? If Intel still makes those memory that's stable, you don't have to do it. A statement is, if Intel still makes the, the persistent memory, the Optane memory, if that still existed, would we have to still do any of this? Because yeah. uh, if you lose the memory, if, if in that scenario you lose the memory, you probably lost the hard drive. Uh, so you said in that scenario, if you lose the memory, you possibly lose the hard drive. What do you mean by lose the hard drive? Like if it's persistent, the only reason memory is still off is because it's persistent. Memory got stored, the hard drive is still uh, So that I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of persistent memory right now. Um, you would still want to do something like this uh, for, re for for redundancy reasons. Uh, there's still an ordering issue you have to deal with of like when you actually apply changes. Um, you don't also you don't. Uh, I mean, some changes could be hanging around in your like in your like CPU caches, like L3, and those may not be written to, to actually the DIMMs yet, the, the Optane memory. It's it's not magic, right? Right. You still have to do some extra work, and logging would be the way to do it. Comment? Question? No. Okay. All right. So again, there's some optimizations. You guys are smart. You'll probably pick up on what obviously what these can be. Well, we'll hold off on those in the end. Okay. All right, so the first thing we got to do is we got to extend the, the write-ahead log records that we talked about last class or introduced last class to now introduce some additional information. And the thing we're going to add now is called the log sequence number or, or the LSM. And this is just going to be a monotonically increasing counter that's going to get added to every single log record so that we know the order in which they should appear in the write-ahead log. Yes, this, this could become a bottleneck because now there's a single counter. Everybody's got to go increment by one and get a new number. Uh, but you know, there's, there's, there's ways to get around that, but we, we can ignore that too, right? So every single time now I'm going to go uh, update a record in the database, I have to go create a write-ahead log record first. I go to this LSM counter, get a new number, increment it by one, and then I add that to my write-ahead log record, and it gets appended to the log, right? And these log record numbers, or log sequence numbers, are going to permeate all throughout the rest of the system uh, because we're going to, again, use that to indicate what sort of the watermark is, the threshold is, of how far, uh, how, wh wh when did something get modified and has that entry that corresponds to that modification been written out to disk? So every, every log record is going to have an LSN, but then now in different parts of the system, they're also going to keep track of LSNs that, again, indicate who modified it and when. So the first thing we're going to have uh, for a page, or sorry, first thing we're going to maintain in memory is just the, called the flush LSN. And this would be, again, the watermark of the, the, of the last LSN that we know has been safely written out the disk. And then now for every single page, we're going to maintain two different LSNs. One would be the page LSN that corresponds to what was the, the most recent update to that page. What was, the course, what was the log record that made the most recent modification to that page? And then the rec LSN would just be what's the, the oldest update that we know has been, sorry, what's the oldest update since the page was last flushed to disk? So when I bring a page into memory I, and I update it, I'll set the page LSN and the rec LSN. And then if I keep updating that page over and over again, I'll increment the page LSN, but not the rec LSN. All right, and then the last LSN would be the, for a given transaction, was the last, uh, was the last log record in the write-ahead log that this transaction created. And then we'll have this master record LSN that's going to keep track of what's the last successful checkpoint that we took in, for, for the database system. Because we're going to use that as the jump off point to say how, where to start looking in the log after a crash, after recovery. Right? So the page LSN and rec LSN, you just store these in the page header. Um, and then, you know, they get written out to disk, but when they get brought back in, uh, you know, you, you can reset them accordingly. Right? All right. So this is basically summarizing what I already just said. So each data page has, has a page LSN. And it's the LSN of the most recent update to that page. 
They have to keep track of the flush LSN to keep track of what's the, the oldest LSN that we flushed out so far. Uh, sorry, the newest LSN we flushed out so far. Um, and then anytime we're going to write to a page on disk, or sorry, anytime we're going to write, flush a page out to disk, we got to go check to see is that page LSN less than or equal to the flush LSN. Meaning, do we know that the log record that most recently modified this page, has that been flushed out to disk? If yes, then we know that, that it's durable, and therefore, if uh, we can write that page out to disk because we know we have the log record that says how to put it back to the state that it was in at the moment we flushed it out. If it's not, if it's the other way around, if the page LSN is greater than the flush LSN, then we can't flush that page out because we have to make sure the log record's flushed first. So let's look, look, look through a visual example. So, uh, in, so in memory, we're going to have a, the, the, the tail of the right-ahead log, and then we have our buffer pool contents. And then see, now we've added into our log records, we now included these log sequence numbers. And again, it's just a counter incrementing by one every single time. And we would store these out on, on disk as well. Then we have our, uh, within a page in memory, we're going to have the page LSN and the rec LSN. Uh, so the page LSN, again, is the is the, the most recent update to the page, and the rec LSN would be the, the first update to the page when it was brought into memory. Then we have our flush LSN, it's just going to point to the, 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 the tail of the log in, on disk. So in this case here, it would be log record 16. And the master record just points to the, the last successful checkpoint. For, for simplicity, I'm just a single checkpoint record. There will actually be multiple checkpoints, begin and end, with fuzzy checkpoints, checkpoints, and we'll cover that in a second. All right, so let's say that we have the page LSN here pointing to log record 12, right? And our flush LSN is pointing to log record 16. So the buffer pool eviction policy says, I want to flush this out the disk. Are we allowed to do it at this point? Yes, right? Because the, the page LSN is 12, the flush LSN is 16, 12 is less than 16, so we know the log record 12 that was written, that, that modified this, has been written to disk. So it's okay to flush this. Right, but if the page LSN, say, points to 19, then we, can't, we cannot flush it because 16 was the last record we, we flushed out, 19 is still in memory, therefore we can't write the page before we write the log record. So in this case here, we'd have to stall and wait until the, or pick another page to evict, because uh, we, we can't evict this one. Right? Pretty simple. Right? It's a way to again, keep track of sort of decentralized uh, of like, is it safe to write something out? You just check these LSNs. Yes? Then when, you, when do you increase the flush LSN? The question is, when do you increase the flush LSN? So you, so you increase the flush LSN when you, when you write out this, like whenever you write out it's in memory, the right, right head log, then you would update this, this thing with the, the, the oldest or the, the largest log record. When the when the in-memory log page is full, yes, like last time, we, when we got full, we wrote it out to disk. Once we do it f-sync, we know it's safely out in disk, then we would update this, this thing. Could you just stop this one where you need to check is there any page with a smaller page LSN and then you previously want to flush it out, but you didn't? So the question is, would you, would you upon flushing the, the log to disk, and then you update this thing, would you then go back and say, oh, here's some pages I wanted to evict, but I couldn't evict before? No, you just, because now this, this is like a global, global or a record or global counter. This thing gets updated. So next time, whatever thread is doing the buffer pull replacement, it would say, okay, well, my flush LSN is this. Here's a bunch of pages I can now, I can now evict, right? Now, there may, may be some cases where the, the buffer pool is full. full and it could block, right? Like, like you can't find anything to evict. It says, I have to evict this page. It has to block until, it, until it, it gets notified that this thing's been flushed out. Then you can evict it, right? Ideally, it can happen, but ideally, you don't want that to be the case. Um, this is also why there's that. I mean, we, we didn't really talk about the background writer stuff, but there's like this, this background worker thread that's like going through and uh, it's trying to flush out dirty pages that, that satisfy this, this requirement. It's trying to proactively flush out these dirty pages so that when next time the eviction policy needs to run, it has a bunch of clean pages it can, it, can, it can pick out right away. OK, so again, this is just a summary of what I've already said. All records are going to have, all log records are going to have this log sequence number. 
And every time we update a page, uh, every transaction is going to modify something in a page, we're going to update that page's page LSM. And then when we flush out the log records, uh, the tail of the right head log in memory out the disk, once we get back the F sync, then we update the flush LSM to be the, the largest log sequence number of the, the records we just wrote out. Right? So far, so good? Okay. So, again, now we want to run transactions. So, again, for, now, for, this, for this lecture, we're just going to assume it's just reads and writes like we had before. We're not going to worry about SQL statements or anything more complicated. We can also ignore indexes. Um, they more or less work the same way. Um, so some other assumptions we're going to make are we're going to assume, to make, for, simplify things in this lecture, we're going to assume all the log records are going to sit, uh, fit into a single page. Um, you obviously can update records that are, or tuples that are larger than a single page. And therefore, the log record has to span multiple pages. The way you just handle that is you just keep track of like segment IDs. It's uh, so like when you write a log record, you'd say it's you know it's log record. Uh, here's part one of four, and if you know if you see all four parts across four pages, then you have the complete log record. Otherwise, you don't, and then it's considered you know it's considered torn right, and you can ignore it, right? But for, for simplicity, we assume it fits in a single page. We're assume all our disk writes are, are atomic, of course. We're in all our examples. We're going to do a single version database system. Uh, using strong strict 2PL, so we don't worry about one transaction acquiring the exclusive lock uh, and making changes as we try to roll back during an abort. Again, that simplifies things. With multi-versioning, some things are easier, some things are harder. Um, and of course, as we said, we're going to use st steel no force. OK? All right, so when a transaction commits, uh, we have to append a commit record to the log. And before we can tell the outside world that our transaction has committed, we need to guarantee that all the log records uh, up to that commit for that transaction are flushed to disk. Right? This is called a synchronous commit. Some sim systems can, can support what are called asynchronous commit, where it's like a best effort. You tell the outside world your transaction is committed, and then you assume some milliseconds later your, your transaction will be written to disk. The algorithm is essentially the same, which is whether or not you block or not. For our purposes, we'll assume we block. Right? So all the log flushes are going to be sequential. Uh, written out the disk, and again, one within one page, lo log buffer page could have multiple log records that correspond to either the transaction that's committing or other actor transactions that are running at the same time, and that's okay, right? We'll, we'll deal with that. Deal with those transactions if they don't commit later on. All right. So, so at this point, the transactions commit. We flush the commit record at the disk. We now know our transaction is durable. Everything we need to say we can replay that transaction later on to recover its changes is out on disk. So we're fine. So that's why it's okay for us to tell it's okay for us to tell the outside world that the transaction has committed. So then, at some later point now, uh, which I'll define when that is in a bit, uh, we're going to introduce a new log log record called transaction end. And this transaction end is going to be a sort of additional metadata or hint for us in the right ahead log to tell the database system that it will not see any more log records for this transaction after this point. And for, for commit, it's pretty obvious, right? Like I do commit, and then at some later point I do end, and like that's when I'm done. When we do aborts, we'll see that I'm going to abort, do some extra stuff, then do transaction end. So that's why we need this. But for now, just assume that we call commit. And if we wanted to, we could immediately add a transaction end to the same uh, as well. But depending on how you're doing concurrency control and validation, you need to wait for other transactions. This may come at some later point. Yes? So, so like, if, if you're committing something, right, and you're flushing everything to board, uh, board six, and, uh, but some previous transaction, like, they dirty the page, mm -hmm. and then, you know, maybe their page got evicted back to disk, but then they got aborted, and would you have to reverse the, that, the part those aborted transactions made? Right? So the statement is, if I have one transaction commits, and in my, my right ahead log buffer, I flush out all its log records. But in those log records, are a bunch of changes from, from another transaction that was running at the same time. Yeah. And that transaction then later, later aborts. Yeah. How do I handle that? Yeah. Two slides. Uh, we'll get there, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so again, we have this new transaction end record. Just says that we know, we can guarantee that at this point, we will never see this transaction ever again in the log. And this will make it easier for when we do recovery to know that nothing else is, we, we can throw its sort of, we can throw some metadata away. 
right? Now, the transaction end record does not need to be flushed to disk immediately. Commit record does, assuming you're doing synchronous commits. Before I can tell the outside world, I have to flush this. This thing could come, come later point, and it's fine. All right, so say we hand, this is going back to our example here. Uh, T4 is going to begin, make some changes, and then commit. So when we see the commit record here, we're going to flush the, the contents of the write ahead log, the in memory buffer at the disk. Once we know that is durable, right, we can tell the outside world that we've committed. We can also then update this flushed LSN to now point to the, the, the tail of the log records we just, push, we just pushed out. So now it's 15, right? And then at some later point, we'll say, all right, this transaction is completely done. And, and we'll just say it's end, right? And then eventually this thing will get written out. We can also sort of maybe assume too that we can, we can blow away the contents of this memory buffer here, free it up, and then use it for, for new log entries. That's sort of that group commit thing I showed before where you have two log buffers, you fill up one, start flushing that out, then you fill up the other one and you sort of ping pong them back and forth, right? Pretty easy so far. Okay, so let's how to see how to handle boards. So a boarding transaction can be treated as a special case uh, where we're essentially going to be creating new log entries that are going to reverse the changes that I made, the transaction made when it was running before the abort, right? And to keep to make it faster for us to figure out what we actually need to abort for a transaction, we're going to introduce another field to our log entry, uh, log record called the previous LSN. And you can sort of think of this as like a almost like a the version chain or or a linked list of here's the here's the order or here's the here's the list of all the the operations I applied for this transaction, and so I can follow that to go find what I need to reverse, right? It's not required. It just makes our life easier uh, when, when we have to scan a lot of logs. All right, so we have our transaction here. Uh, well, the first thing, the point here is to point out we have the, the LSN, and now we have the previous LSN. So in the last entry, the LSN is 14, the previous one is 13, and so forth going up. And then for this top guy here, uh, it's the beginning, it's the first log record for this transaction. So therefore, its previous LSN is just null, right? So transaction then aborts. And then it has to, we have to do something. And then we're going to have transaction end, right? And again, this just says that there's nothing else comes, comes after this. So the thing we need to talk about here is what we actually need to do between the time we get the abort log record and we find the transaction end of like what we need to do to reverse those changes, right? And we need those changes to also be written out to the log because we need to make sure that if we crash during recovery, we would know what the changes we're making to reverse things when we come back so that we can correctly reverse them again. And the, the, so the idea is that we're going to do these new log records called compensation log records, CLRs, that are just going to be reversals of the, some previous action that the transaction took before it aborted. And it's going to look exactly like the, uh, like a regular update log record, except now we're just going to have this uh, keep track of like here's the the rec here's the here's the log the LSN of the log record I'm, I'm reversing, and then here's the LSN of the next thing I need to look at in my previous LSN. So I know how to go back through time through the log and try to find all the entries I need to reverse, right? So we're going to add these to the uh, so we're going to add these to the log just as as you do when we process transactions normally. But the key is that unlike when we commit, where before we say, yes, you've committed, uh, we have to make sure all the log records are flushed out the disk. If a transaction tells us we abort, or if we like there's a deadlock and we kill one of the transactions, we don't have to wait till these CLRs are flushed to disk before we tell the outside world that your transaction has been aborted. Right? Because like, who cares? Because if I come back and try to, uh, try to read those changes, I shouldn't be able to see them because even though I may have not reversed them yet, even though the CLRs aren't flushed out the disk, the higher level mechanisms in concurrency control, like the versioning, if it's, if it's multi-versioned, or uh, if it's, if it's two-phase locking, I would still have these things locked. Like, no one's going to see our changes before we actually reverse them, and that's okay. That's what, that, that's what we want. So that's why we can release, we can tell the outside world you've aborted sooner rather than later. Yes? When you say abort and you are doing the abort and then the database crashes. Yes. Even if you crash it, you still hold the, the latches or the locks? No, no, no. So, so 
yeah, so maybe I've sort of fuddled this. So what I'm saying is like, if I call commit, like uh, from my application calls commit, I don't get an acknowledgement from the database server that I've committed successfully until those log records are flushed to disk, the, the commit record including, right? So, but if I call abort, then I, I'll get back a, immediately, yeah, you've aborted. Even though the log records that correspond to the reversing your changes have not been written to disk yet. Because the higher level protection mechanisms of the concurrential scheme, think of like multi-versioning or, or, or 2PL or OCC, when I come back and try to read the things that, from the last transaction that I, that I just got aborted, I won't be able to see them. It doesn't matter that those log records have not been flushed to disk yet. Because when you call abort, your changes won't be written out. They could be, and we have to reverse them. We'll get there, right? I'm just saying that, like, again, that, like, again, the key idea is commit. You have to wait to, for the log records are flushed. Abort, you do not. But if I abort and I, I crash it, uh, when I come back, I immediately select what I, I intend. No, no, no. So, so when, you cr when you crash and come back, you actually can't run any queries until we go back in the correct state and reverse all changes from avoided transactions. So when we come back, you'll see this in a second, there's a bunch of stuff we have to do before we tell the, the world, hey, we're ready, start sending us queries. Okay. All right. Uh, but again, I would say, that even though, again, we don't have to tell the outside, we don't have to wait to tell the outside world that our, that our transactions are boarded before the, the all the log records are flush, we still have to follow the regular write ahead log protocol that says the log record that last updated the page has to be written to disk before we can flush that, that dirty page out the disk. Right? Even again, even if the transaction is aborted uh, and we haven't rolled back to all these changes, we can still write out the disk. The steel policy allows us to do that. We just have to make sure that the log record that modified it is out on disk. All right, so I'm, I'm running out of space on PowerPoint, so we're going to switch to a tabular form for this, this example. All right, so let's see how we actually want to roll back a transaction. So we have T1, just a begin, then an update on A, and then it aborts, right? So on abort, the first thing we're going to do is, the very first thing we're going to do is, is create a CLR uh, that's going to reverse the change we made before, right? So we keep track of, this is the CLR that's going to reverse the log record, uh, the, the update that happened at log, log record 2. And all we're doing is just reversing the change. So 40, uh, we said it, to, we said it was 30 before, we set it to 40. So now we expect it to be 40, and we're going to reverse it back to 30. So it just looks like a reg regular update log record, but it has a special status to say, you know, we're, we're reversing things for this particular log rec record from, from before. And then we just have this undo next uh, pointer that just tells us here's the next thing that we we need we need to reverse, right? Because the the previous LSM would correspond to the, 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 the abort log record we had before. So we don't we want to skip that. We want to jump up to the, the, the next thing we need to potentially abort. In this case here, it would be the uh, begin entry. So at this point now, there's nothing for us to undo anymore for this transaction. So now this is where we add the transaction and re log record. Right? And it's just saying that there's nothing else to, to, uh, nothing else to abort or roll back. And we'll never see this transaction ever again after this. Yes. Can, uh, can a 30 bit statement and a board transaction be uh, flushed out? The statement, the question is can a dirty page written by a transaction that has been aborted flush out to disk? Yes. But the log record, again, that, course, that, that, that modified it, the, the, the newest log record that modified it has to be flushed out to disk first. So it's okay that on disk there might, there's a bunch of pages that, that were modified by transactions that got aborted. That's fine. We'll, we'll fix that. All right. So yeah. So to example here. So maybe the case that like at at this at, for when we did the update, it's some page we brought into memory. We modified it. Uh, then the transaction aborted. But by the time we, before we, we actually reverse it, it got flushed out the disk. At this point here, it's just like, re, like running a regular update. We got to bring the page back in, then reverse it. And then we add, you know, we add the log entry first for that. But what if, like, the dirty page was written to disk, and then when you are trying to append the CLR, you immediately got a chance to flush the CLR. So his question is, and this is the recovery process, his question is, I bring the page in, I update it, then I get the dirty page gets written out, 
And before I can re reverse the change, I crash and come back. When we crash and come back, we'll replay this and reverse it. Yeah. Yes. Question? So by replay, you mean just still changing the entire log? Correct. Yes. By replay, I mean like reapplying the changes that we've seen in the log. The question is, uh, when I replay the log, I'll see this update. Do I know I not, not don't need to do it or have to reverse it because it aborts later on? What do you, what, what's your question? Sorry. Because it's like when we see the update, this may or may not like the thirty information may or may not be in the system already, so the time has to version the double. Check. Correct. Yes. This this goes back to my statement I said at the beginning. It's going to seem like what we're doing is wasteful because like yeah, if if, if we if this dirty change didn't get written back. Get the dirty change, the change to the aborted transaction didn't get written to the disk. Why replay it? We're always going to replay it because we want to get back to the state we were exactly at the moment of the crash. Then we're going to go back and reverse things to, to remove any aborted transaction updates. What if we don't log CLR? Question is, what if we don't log the CLR? And then, and then what? We just, after finish the abort process, we write the JSON and. So you're saying if I don't log this, yeah. but I apply the change, yeah. and then I just write this out? Yeah. So then I crash and come back, and how, how do I know? Huh? Uh, right, so, so if you don't have this, uh, and I crash and come back, and I, I just, you're basically doing the same thing over and over again. So for efficiency reasons, you, this will help you from avoiding having to update things over does and over again. Does this happen the question, does this happen often with continuous failures? It would happen enough that you would care. If it happens to you, you would care, right? Harbor is super unreliable. You guys are spoiled. Things, things are way better than they used to be, right? Yes? So it's a CLR, we can do it as an optimized version of replay. But in the worst case scenario, if we don't do the CLR, we can do replay in the in a lesser version. Uh, so it's question if without CLRs, could we just do replay over and over again and be less efficient? I think the answer is yes. So, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, another thing about it, it's like, it's like a double ledger almost, right? That like, because what happens if the page with this update gets corrupted, right? Then I'm hosed, and now I gotta like, I have to hopefully have a backup. But actually, it can get corrupted in some weird way, like, like bits, bits get flipped, but having the log record, the right ahead logs, you know, additional redundancy allows me to put it back to the correct state. Postgres actually does something like this. So Postgres, uh, what they'll do is in the, they'll have these write ahead log entries, but when you first bring a page into memory, the first transaction that modifies it, I think they write the entire page out in the write ahead log. So that way, if the if the actual table heap gets gets crashed or gets corrupted, you at least have a, a version of the page in the write ahead log to replay, and you apply the whole thing on top of it. Correct. I mean, it's almost like the log structure stuff. You only really need the log. You don't really need, but like for performance reasons, you have two copies. And, and for liability reasons, you have two copies. Okay. All right. So to abort a transaction, we said a lot of this already. I'll just go through it one more time. So we're going to write an abort record out the log first. Uh, we don't have to tell, we don't have to wait to tell the outside world that this happened. Um, and then we're going to look at the, the, all the updates that happened that the transaction made in reverse order, going from newest to oldest. And we're going to write a CLR entry to the log, apply the change to, to re replace the old value. And then when, when we reach the begin, because we're going back in time, we see the begin log record for this transaction. We know there's no other log record that could, could appear uh, further back in time in the log. So therefore, we just write the transaction end record, and then we release our locks, and then, then we're done with this transaction. Again, assuming we're doing two-phase locking, we, like a transaction says they abort, we don't immediately release the locks. We hold the locks because we need to still go back and update them. Then we get transaction end, then we release the locks. And that avoids the problem of someone trying to update the, the, the record between the time we abort and the time we, we, we have the end. And then for CLRs, we don't need, we don't need a CLR for the CLR, right? It just, there's enough information to says in there for us to, to undo it. 
All right, so we got through log sequence numbers, and now we know how to do uh, additional things at runtime to do commits and aborts. Uh, and of course, as we said last time, the logs can grow forever, so we need a way to, to limit how far back in time we have to look in the log, and we're going to do this through, through checkpoints. So we're going to first look at two sort of crappy ways to do checkpoints, and then we'll see what fuzzy checkpoints are as, as the, is the proper way to do this, to handle the case without having to block everyone. So last class I said the, way to, the simple way to do checkpoints was just you halt the start of any new transaction, like no transaction call begin, you wait to any active transaction that is still running finishes, uh, and then at that point you flush all the dirty pages out to disk because you know there's no transaction that maybe updated one page uh, that gets written to disk and updates another page that didn't get written to disk. You have a consistent snapshot of the database in the buffer pool, or the pages in the buffer pool, and you write that out. And we said this is obviously bad for performance reasons because if I have a transaction that's going to take an hour, then I have to stop running any new transactions for an hour, wait till that one hour transaction finishes, then I take the checkpoint. Right? There are some systems, like on, on like really small embedded devices, that do work this way because they're assuming their transactions are super super short, and, and you can make you you can make this optimization, but most most systems do not do this, right? So, a slightly better way to do this would be to instead of waiting for transactions to finish, we could just pause them. And say they're not allowed to any make any more updates. Like if the query running and, and it's updating multiple pages. We just sort of halt it while it's actually running, right? And we don't wait to, for them to finish. We just take the checkpoint immediately. Of course, the problem with this one is that we're going to have inconsistent checkpoints, right? So let's say I have two threads. One, one, one wants to take a checkpoint, and one, one's, one's a transaction. And transactions can update page one and page three. And the checkpoint just, is just a sequential scan of all the pages that are in memory. And I'm going to write them out to disk, whatever the current state is. All right, so say the transaction updates page three. But then before it can update page one, the checkpoint starts. We stall all transactions. We just pause them. The checkpoint thread then runs through, writes out all the pages out to disk. Then transaction is, is unblocked, and then it updates page one. Right? So this is obviously bad now, because now we have a torn update. Right? What should have been an atomic operation for this transaction is, is now no, no longer that. Right? Because we only saw part of this updates. Right? So to handle this, we're going to keep track of some additional metadata now in our checkpoints about what transactions were running at the time we took the checkpoint, and then what were the, what were the pages that were dirty at when the checkpoint started, so that we can know that when we have to replay the log from the checkpoint, the checkpoints, you know, we're bringing in all the pages that were, that were, that were in the, the checkpoint basically says at this point here, here's what the status of the pages were in my, that were out in the disk. And I would know what could potentially have been modified while I was taking the checkpoint. So I know sort of roughly where in the log to go look out and figure out what log records I need to reapply, because they may or may not have written out to disk. So for the active transaction table, that's basically for every transaction that's active or that's actively running, we're just going to keep track of what the, the tr transaction identifier, what the status is of the transaction, uh, and then what's the last LSN that they created. And then once we see the transaction end record, uh, we can remove it from, from this actual transaction table. So this is something we could be maintaining while we're actually running the system. Uh, but then we'll also maintain this when we do recovery. So the status codes for transactions are going to be either I'm running, committing, or I'm a candidate for un undo. And so during normal operations, it's, you know, it's either you're running or you're, you're finishing up a committing. But when we do recovery, the default status is going to be this undo, undo mode. Because when we're replaying the log, we don't know what's going to come up ahead. So we assume that we're not going to see a transaction commit record. And therefore, we, we, it's going to be something we have to roll back and undo. And only when we see the commit, then, then we flip its status to commit. The dirty page table is, again, just keeping keep track of what pages are in the buffer pool that are, that have been, that are been modified. Uh, there's a, what pages in the, the buffer pool have been modified but not flushed out to disk. And so the only thing we need to keep track of here is the what's the LSN of the of for the transaction that, that caused this page to get dirty, first get dirty when it was brought into memory. Right? Page LSN is keep track of like what's the, the most recent update to this page, the rec LSN, and what was the first LSN when I brought into memory. 
So as you can see, I'm running out of space in the PowerPoint here, but let's see what we can do. All right, so we have our first checkpoint here, uh, and we're going to record in our actor transaction table at the time we took the checkpoint that the only actor transaction was T2, right? Because T1 started before the checkpoint, but then we saw the transaction end. So at that point, we, we know we're not going to see T1 ever again, so we don't need to include it in our actor transaction table. And then for our dirty page table, uh, we assume that there's only one page uh, that's that's uh, that's in our buffer pool that, that's been that's dirty, and that's P22. So we assume that transaction T1 updated P11, but then something happened and this thing got written out the disk, uh, and so it's not dirty anymore. Um, and so the only other one is is this update here that corresponds to T2, right? So then at the second checkpoint, same thing, the actor transaction table is we have T2 because that started way, way up above. I mean, you haven't seen a, we haven't seen a commit. Actually, is that true? That's wrong. Hold on, that might be a typo. Yeah, sorry, that should be a typo. Give, give it a T2 there. Uh, it just, should just be T3, right? Because at this point here, T2, T2 is already committed. Ah, no, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. We haven't seen the transaction end yet. That, that's why this is still considered active, right? So just because you see a commit, but not the end, it's technically still active, even though it's not going to actually do anything yet. And then for T3, again, we haven't seen a commit or end, or sorry, haven't seen the end message, so it's still active. And then for the dirty page table, it's P11 and, and P33, right? So this is enough information for us to get back to the correct state, right? Because we know here's the pages that are dirty, here's the transactions we should look for in the log, make sure we apply those changes. But again, we're still stalling uh, transactions while we take this checkpoint. Right, because it's sort of like a single place in time in the log. Here, I'm taking my checkpoint, and I assume that all my 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 flush out flushing out my dirty pages are atomic for my buffer pool, which is not realistic. Right, if I have one terabyte of memory, I can't flush out one terabyte of memory to disk atomically. Right, so this is still not what we want to do because, you know, this thing could take a long, long time. So this is what fuzzy checkpoints are going to solve. So the fuzzy checkpoints, the data system is going to allow actual transactions to keep on running, make changes to the database, just, just as they would, would normally, uh, but we're still going to be able to take a checkpoint and flush out all our, our dirty pages. And so now in the, in the right ahead log, we're going to have a, the, the checkpoint entry is going to have two parts. It's going to have the, the, the time when the, the checkpoint began and the time when the checkpoint uh, finished. And inside the checkpoint end entry, we, we're going to keep track of like what is the actual transactions and what were the dirty, dirty pages, right? And so the idea is that the tables are sort of only accurate or consistent at the moment we took the checkpoint started, uh, but then we can't guarantee that any dirty pages that were modified after the checkpoint started uh, will also be written as well, right? So if we go back to our example here. So again, assume that P11 has been flushed before the first checkpoint starts here. All right, so we add our checkpoint begin entry, and then, and then uh, other transac transactions will keep on running. We're flushing out the dirty pages. And then when we get to the checkpoint end, we would say, OK, what were the transactions that were, what, what are the transactions that started before my checkpoint began? In this case, it's just T2. And then what were, what were the pages that were modified or dirty before my checkpoint began? And this is just P22, so assuming P11 got, got flushed beforehand, right? Because the idea here is that when we do recovery, we want to start at the checkpoint begin, and we'll scan through in the log and see all the changes that came after it, the log records that came after it. So we would see this update to P11 that right before the, the checkpoint end comes, shows up. But we need to know how far back in time the write ahead log that we need to look. Right? So the active transaction table and the dirty page table is just telling us, hey, by the way, there's some transactions that up above the, the checkpoint begin that you should look for because they made some changes that we may have not uh, gotten out to disk. And then when the, uh, when the checkpoint, uh, wait, is it this? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And then when the, we successfully flush out the checkpoint end record, then we update the master record in, in the database system to point to the checkpoint begin in the log, right? Because that's going to be our starting point when we are, start scanning for things. 
But we'd use, again, the, the ATT and DBT are just giving us hints of what, what's above it. Yes? Uh, when it crashes, you start from the check for business. Yes. Well, you, you start your analysis there. Well, uh, we see there's some changes made there. Yeah, so, so to be, uh, we'll, we'll, it's the next slide. We'll get to here. But basically, the, this question is like, when I say we started the check when it began, I mean we're going to start an analysis of this, scan for it, and figure out what's going on. But the DBT and ATT are going to give us hints to say, hey, up above the checkpoint begin, there's some changes you've got to go look at and potentially and, and reapply them. Because you're looking at, like, after the beginning, like, before the end. Like, you think you are starting at the position where the checkpoint begins, but actually what's in the disk is the checkpoint end. Uh, so your statement is, at, like, during your analysis, uh, you think you're looking at what's on disk from checkpoint begin, but it's really checkpoint end? Yeah, yeah. That's fine, because I'm, I'm, I'm still going to have to replay all the log records anyway, so. Wouldn't you double apply something? Again, would you double apply something? Yes, there'll be cases where we will, we will double apply, but that's okay. Because we want to guarantee that things, ha things are actually all written. All right. All right, so let's go, I mean, we've been sort of dancing around how we're actually doing recovery. Let's, let's actually walk through it now. Based on like the, the building blocks, we have the log sequence numbers, we have the CLRs, and we have fuzzy checkpoints with the DPT and the ATT. So ARIES is gonna have three phases. The first one is in the analysis phase where we're gonna use the master record to jump to the, the, mo the most recent successful checkpoint begin entry. And then we're gonna scan forward in the log, just read the log entries, and build the, an actor transaction table and a, a dirty page table from, from that point to the end of the log. Right? And the idea is that we're trying to figure out what was going on in the system at the moment of the crash, both in, in what's in memory and potentially what's out on disk. So once we do the analysis, then we do the redo phase, and we're going to jump back to the, some farther point in the log, which, which potentially could be above that checkpoint begin, and we're going to replay all the log records that we see including any, any, log, any transactions that could potentially abort later on. Because again, we want to put the database back into to the exact state uh, at the moment of the, of the crash. Then after we do redo, now we're going to do undo. Now we're going to go in reverse order in the log from the, from the end up to some point, and we're going to undo any changes from transactions that we know did not commit at the moment of the crash. Because we'd have, we'd see this in the actual transaction table. We would know what are the, what are the transactions actually running. If we don't see a transaction commit message for them, then we know that they, they, they should be aborted. And some of those changes that they, those aborted transactions made could have been written to disk. So we need to go back and make sure we reverse them, and so that nothing persists after the crash. So then, after we finish the undo step, then the system is back into a clean state, consistent state. All the transactions that committed before the crash, or all the changes are applied. All the transactions that did not commit or aborted before the crash, all the changes are reversed. And therefore, we now can open ourselves up for business. We can start running new queries and running new transactions. And if we know changes from transactions that got aborted will carry over after the crash. So I realize I'm making hand gestures here. So let's see what this looks like visually. All right, so here's our right hand log. And we're going forward from time from oldest to newest from, from top to the bottom. So after a crash, we enter the analysis phase. And the idea is to figure out from the last checkpoint, from the start of the last checkpoint, we're going to scan forward uh, from that point to the end of the log and just look and see what are all the transactions that were running at this time and what changes did they make. Then in the redo phase, we're going to jump up to the, the smallest rec LSN in our dirty page table that we identified after the, after the checkpoint. So this would be what's the oldest change that we need to apply that hasn't been applied to flush out the disk. And we're just going to redo everything. Get e even, even, even if a transaction gets aborted, we're going to redo it. Then in the last step, the undo phase, now we're going to go uh, in reverse order back into the point to the log where we have the, lo the, the log record of the, the, the oldest transaction that was active at the moment that we crashed. We're going to make sure all their changes are not persistent and we, re we remove them. Yes? The question is, how do you find the smallest rec LSN? We'll, we'll, we'll pop in the DPT in a second. We'll see the next, next slides. But you find this, you, this is what the analysis phase does. 
right? Because you would look at the dirty page table and say, okay, what is, uh, what was the rec I'll send for that, for that dirty page? Therefore, that's when I need to go start from there and make sure it get, gets reapplied. Right? There's some obvious optimizations you can do that we're not, we don't have to go through, but like if I, if everybody's updating the same page, this, you know, a single record, you know, why reverse all of them or why reapply all of them if you're just going to overwrite them over and again, why just jump to the most recent version? Again, that's, that analysis can be tricky. It's just easier to blindly reapply. Yes. This question, how much of a nightmare is this to implement? Uh, well, it's, it's hard enough that like you're a random JavaScript program and you don't want to do it yourself. There's that, right? No, this is hard. Yeah. What's the alternative? Give up. Give up? <laughs> or you could go work at a database company and get paid a lot of money and build this. All right? Like, there you go. Is this harder than implementing a B tree? Uh, <laughs> Again, you like how this is. Hard drives used to be really wonky. In the old days, this is really like hard to do all sorts of weird shit, like break on you. It's gotten way reliable now, so it's 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 gotten better. But you still want to be super careful about all this, all right? Yes. Um, I'm getting confused. Like, I understand the redo is because some transaction said um, I commit, and then you do write a log, but their changes have not been flushed out to this. Yes. And that's why you want to start with the smallest uh, IEC LS and to redo the change and then commit, like flush it to this, those who really commit. Yes. And then uh, what does that mean? Like reverse the effect of failed transaction. What's failed transaction? So for this one here, I'm not, I'm not going to care for, for the, when I do redo, I'm not going to try to be clever and say, well, I know this transaction is going to bore, so I don't need to redo it. You redo everything. Okay. Right? So now that includes transactions that, that are going to abort. And you know they're going to abort because you've done the analysis phase. Because at, at the end of the analysis phase, you look at your actual transaction table. If it's not marked as committed, it's aborted. Right? But at this, the redo phase, you just, you just redo everything yeah. for simplicity reasons. Then the undo phase is, OK, well, what, what, are, my, what are my transactions in my ETT that are, that are aborted? Let me go find their log records and then re re reverse them. Some transaction will say like user will type in abort later on before you crash it. Uh, you uh, after you crash. Uh, wait, hold up. So so I crash and then they send me an abort command. How would that work? Like um, how do you know some transaction are aborted when you when you crash? Because if it didn't commit, then it's aborted. So any transaction. Any transaction that that was running that did not commit is aborted. Why would, so, like, that's what you want. So two is apply all the changes that's not flushed out to this. And three is a, just a undo any transaction that's not committed. Correct, yes. Okay. Then if you do two and three, why would you need one? Because one, you need to figure out what the hell is actually, you need, you need to, like, what you need to do. Okay. Right? Like, if I'm going to drive somewhere, I got to know where to go, right? Like, I, I need a map or directions. Same thing. All right, so let's go through these one by one. Um, okay, so now analysis phase, uh, we're going to scan for from the last successful checkpoint. If we see a transaction end record, then we can remove its entry from our actual transaction table. Otherwise, if for a given log record, if that transaction that corresponds to that created that log record, if it's not in our actual transaction table, then we add it, but with the default status of undo, because we don't know at this point as we're reading each log record one by one, is it going to commit or not? So we assume it's not. But then we see a commit log record. We'll change its status to commit. And then once we see the transaction end record, we'll just remove it from the ATT. For any update log record, if the page is not already in our DPT, then we'll add it and we'll set its rec LSN to what our, what our LSN is for, for the log. Right? So think about it. We have this ATT and DPT that we generate for checkpoints. And the idea is to populate them with additional information when we do our analysis. So at the end now, yes, sorry. So the question is, when is this, when is the transaction out of status running? During the, during recovery, never. It's always, it's always going to be, un, it's always going to be, say, default is undo. 
until we learn otherwise that it commits. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Do you have to log HTTP and TPP upon checkpoint end, or is this is just for performance? Uh, so the question is, do I have to log the HTTP and TPP when I see checkpoint end? Yeah. Yes. When we do at runtime normally, when we do fuzzy checkpoints, we log this. Uh, but if you don't log, does it affect correctness? Uh, if you don't log, does it affect correctness? Um, you can still repopulate. You could still repopulate it. Uh, e Yes. Uh, no, no. You, without logging it during the fuzzy checkpoint, you'd have to scan the entire log because you don't know what you missed up above, oh. right? Because I could, like, I could, I could have a transaction make a bunch of changes, then I do a checkpoint, right, and it, it begin and end, and then I don't see that transaction ever again. I crash, come back without that ATT. I don't know there's some transaction up above that wrote a bunch of stuff that I don't know about. You need it, it, by adding to the checkpoint, you, 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 it's a hint to say up above, there's some stuff you got to pay attention to that you might have missed. All right, so at the end, what do we have? We have an ATT that's going to tell us what transactions were active at the time of the crash, either because we saw them after the, the checkpoint, or as I said, they're up above in the log. And then the DPT would tell us what are the dirty pages that might, have, might not have made it to disk, right? Which means we're going to have to bring them back into memory. Uh, and make sure we apply their changes during, during the redo phase, right? Because we don't know what pages got written to disk uh, after the checkpoint finished. All right, so let's see an example here. All right, so the first thing we have is that we have the checkpoint begin. So we just add that to our, uh, uh, well, we, we, we initialize the ATT and the DPT to be empty. And then we now see there's a log record for transaction 96. So we add into our ATT transaction ID 96 with the status of undo, because we don't, we don't know what's going to happen, what, what its final outcome is going to be. And then we see also that it updates page 33. So we would just add in our DPT page 33, and then the rec LSN that, that did the update. Right? So in this, case, in this case here, it's log sequence number 20. Then we have our checkpoint end. And here now we add additional information that we didn't know about from before. This is why, again, why you have to record this. So we knew about 96 since we, when we started scanning our checkpoint because we see the log record for 96. But there's another transaction 97. We didn't see that one before at all. So we know that's up above our checkpoint begin. There was a transaction 97 that's hanging out and doing some stuff, and we got to check on it, right? Same thing for the DPT. We have uh, we know about page 33 because T96 updated that, but now there's a page uh, 20 that was updated at log sequence number eight, and we didn't we haven't scanned that yet. Yes. When you lock the checkpoint and you, you don't you don't have to lock T ninety six, right? Because you know when it crashes and when you replay from the checkpoint begin, you will recover T ninety six anyway. Uh so his point yeah, so like you could remove T ninety six here uh -huh. when it's written out. Uh yeah, like yes. So this again, this analysis phase, worry about this, how I'm populating this. Okay. But yeah, we could remove we should remove T ninety six, yes. How, how do I know I can, I can ignore it? Because I mean, simplicity reason, basically, what are the actual transactions? What transactions were active when the checkpoint started? So in this case here, assuming transaction T96 began at, I don't know, at log sequence number nine. So it's before the checkpoint began. Therefore, if, 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 if you would just add it, right? You don't need to be clever to say, okay, what do, am I still going to see it or not? Yes or no. To his point here, for correctness reasons, if this wasn't in here, T96, because this is out on disk, if this wasn't in here, that's okay because I would see the, the log scene system number 20 be able to update it. But again, the protocol says it's anything that was active. So you could remove it. Correctness, correctness says you, you, you'd still be okay just to make the algorithm more, you know, less, less branching. It's just, you just always add it. Yes. Uh, oh, so, so his question is, how would I know that? How would I know that the 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 for page twenty the rec LSN was eight? Yeah. Uh, it's the first uh, operation that makes twenty dirty. 
Yeah, so I mean, you could bring the page in and look at it, right? It's fine, you can read it. Or you could, I mean, you could potentially log into this. It doesn't matter. So, does it mean that each page has its rec LSN on disk? This question is, does each page have its rec LSN on disk? Yes. And the page LSN, yes. All right, so then we have the transaction N. At this point here, again, this transaction end is telling us we're never going to see T96 ever again, so we can remove it from our, uh, from our, our after transaction table. And then, then we, we, we crash, right? So after, after the end of our analysis phase, this would be the status. We would know that there's a T97 that, uh, transaction 97 that's out there that we need to abort, and then here are some pages that uh, potentially have not been, uh, may not have changes, the changes that were in the right ahead log uh, added to them correctly. All right, so now in the redo phase, the idea is that we want to repeat the history in our write-ahead log and apply all the changes uh, that, that we need that are necessary to, including for transactions that have aborted, to put us, the database state back into, uh, uh, put the database back into the state it was at the moment of the crash, right? And as I said multiple times, there'll be some cases where we can avoid unnecessary reads and writes, uh, but we, we can ignore them for now, right? So again, okay, if I know a transaction, I know a transaction that, uh, is going to abort. Uh, I maybe don't need to bring the page back in just for that transaction to reverse it because it's already been reversed. Right? There's things like that we, we, can, we can ignore. So we're going to scan forward uh, in the right head log uh, from the, the moment, the log record that corresponds to the smallest LSN uh, in a, in a, for a page that was in the, the dirty page table. Right? It's the smallest LSN that modified a page that had not been flushed out to disk. And then as we, as we scan through the log and we look at each log sequence number one by one, um, it, it, if it's an update record or a CLR, uh, for a given LSM, we're going to reapply the change unless the affected page is not in our dirty page table, meaning we know it got flushed out the disk already by the time we finished, um, or the affected page is in our dirty page table, and that, that, that log record's LSN is less than the page's rec LSN. Right? If it's greater, then we know that, again, it, that, it, that it's been flushed out. The change, the change, the change has been applied. Right? So then to redo an action, we just apply the logged update, uh, set the page LSN to that log record's LSN, and then we're done. Move on to the next log record. We don't need to flush the right head log because we're not making any changes right, to, do, to an update. Even even if it's a CLR, all right, and we don't need to flush the, the, the dirty page in, in the buffer pool, we can do that at the end. Right? And then once we reach the end of the redo phase, uh, for all transactions that are marked as committed and still in the actual transaction table, then we append a transaction end record to the log, and we can flush those out and remove that from the, the actual transaction table. So now at the end of the redo, the only things that are going to be in the actual transaction table are transactions we need to undo and reverse their changes. Yes? Like if it crashes during the discovery phase. What, what phase? The redo or like the, the whole thing? Analysis of the, like, so your question is, like, if I crash at any point of these phases, still I come back and I just do it all over again. Yeah. All right, so now we're in the undo phase. So again, these are these are transactions that are in the actual transaction table. We know, you know, we can't accept new commands for them. They're done, right? We we need to re revert their changes. So we're now going to go in reverse order in the log, and roll back roll back any any other updates. I'm going to add CLRs for any time we we reverse the changes, right? And it's basically the thing I showed before, where during normal operation, if I board a transaction, I go back in reverse order reverse their changes and append to a CLR to the log. And then once I reverse everything, then I put a transaction end. It's, we're doing basically the same thing here, right? So, right, so let's go through a full example. So let's say we have, uh, we have the right head log, we have do begin and end, and then we have this transaction T1 here that then calls abort. So during normal operations, we, we would want to abort this. Right? We would just go look and say, what's the, you know, what's the change I made? Go ahead and reverse this. 
you keep track of the the, the version chain or sorry the uh, the the sequence of the, the the log records that need to reverse. And then now uh, I do a bunch of other things, uh, other transactions, and then I crash, come back. So now after my analysis, I do my ATT DPT look like this. So at this point here, again, we crashed, so we're looking at the log up above. We would have T2 and T3. Both of their status is, is, is things we need to undo. Um, and then our dirty page table, we have P1, P3, and P5. So we would look at the last LSN and figure out which one need, we need to reverse first. So 60 is greater than 50. So we're gonna, we're gonna reverse that update first. So we're gonna reverse the update the T2 did. Um, and then the undo next is just gonna be a pointer to say what's the next thing we need, need to reverse. But then now, since we need to do the reverse on T3, because that comes next in the log, uh, we, do, we do apply the update, and then for simplicity, for, since I'm running out of space, I put it on, on a single line. So this is the, the CLR, and then that's the last update we need for this transaction to reverse all its changes. Then we have the transaction end here. Right? At this point here, we could flush the dirty pages and write a log out the disk, because we know, we know that everything here is durable. It's not, it's not required. Uh, it just prevents you from having to do maybe extra work when you come back around the second time. So let's say now we crash though during recovery, right? And all this in, we have in memory gets, gets blown away. So then now when we come back and after analysis phase, the only thing we would have in our action transaction table is T2, right? Because we saw the transaction end record here for T3, that got flushed out the disk. So we, we can ignore it you know, when we come back around after the analysis. So now the, the only thing we need to do is make sure we reverse T2. So it would just be jumping to the CL here redo it to make sure it actually gets applied, uh, follow back up here, apply that CLR, apply that change, flush that out, and then we write our transaction end message here, T2. So just showing you, if I crash during recovery, I come back and just pick up the process where I left off. Is this clear? Yes? Uh, what you can do, you just follow the pointer back until it's like the bigger than the uh, His question is, if when I'm doing undo, I follow this undo next to go back, and I keep doing that until... You hit the beginning. For the transaction or the tr checkpoint? The check. For the transaction. Okay. I keep going back until I make sure I reverse all the changes for the transaction. Okay. Yes? Yes. So that you flush everything before T10. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Sorry. You have uh, timestamp 10. Oh, yeah, time. All right. It already is P5. And you say I flush it when? Yeah, it is flush. When? After everything. Whenever. Okay. Yes. And then it is flush, right? Yes. How would you undo it? Because you never add P1 to like, uh, you never add P1 to ATT. Oh, my example here? Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, so, okay, so let's go back to the here. So after the crash, uh, when I do my analysis, I would have seen the, the, the transaction end message for T1. So therefore, at the end here, T1 was not active, so it shouldn't be in the actual transaction table. It's gone. So that's what I mean that uh, T1, whenever we see like transaction end, it ever means that if it needs to write uh, everything is on disk, and uh, if this abort, everything is reverse. Yeah, hold on. So, so if T1 aborts, I have the, uh, yes. And then it means that uh, it's whatever is like important for computation is on the end of it. Uh,
or Rupert? Yeah, so, so I guess how to say this. Like, yeah, it's hard, hard to do this in PowerPoint. So at this point here, I crash. And then you're right, after analysis, T1 should be in here, right? Then in the redo phase, I'm going to reapply the changes for T T1 here. And then when I do the undo, it wouldn't be in, in my actual transaction table, right? Because I, I didn't, because I, I saw I saw it end. Yeah, so it's, 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 I know, I know the confusion is. So the confusion is that like I'm showing this and I'm saying, okay, after the crash, this is what I saw. But like this is actually the state after I do redo. And that's why T1 is not there because I saw the transaction end. And therefore, I would have applied, I would have reversed the change as defined in the CLR. Right? So now, so what I'm trying to show is here, okay, after I do a redo, what do I need to reverse? Well, I need to reverse T2 and T3. Okay? And so the first thing I'm going to reduce is reverse the first entry, which is 60, going back in reverse order. So I have to create a new CLR for that to reverse 60, follow the undo next, and that's going to tell me I, I need to reverse 20. Right, but I also need to reverse now 50 because that appears next going in reverse order, right? So I reverse the the T3's update at, at LSN 50. I follow LSN. There isn't anything else I need to reverse, right? So I, I can put the end message end record here. But then now at this point, before we can we reverse uh, 20, which is up here, we crash and come back. Then after the second round of analysis and redo, the only thing we need to, to then undo still is is T uh, T two. Yes. So you are only actually redo for those who write a commit log, but you don't see a transaction end log. Uh, you still still need to redo them. Because you, you don't know whether the dirty pages were written written out to disk. The log records have been written to disk. In this way, when I start uh, my analysis, I will first add a T1 into my uh, active table and dirty page table. And when I'm at 45, I see T1 transaction end. I can just ignore any changes or updates brought by T1. Is this correct? No, because the you don't know whether the pages it wrote to that it modified were written out to disk. But didn't transaction end guarantee like any changes brought by? No, T1, transaction end does not guarantee all your dirty pages flush to disk. It just means it just means that you're not going to see it ever again. Okay. Then when would the changes be flushed out to disk? At the checkpoint, or the background writer. Okay. Right. Or on, upon eviction, because because we need we need to swap a page out, make make space for it. Yes. Question: What is DPT actually doing here? So, you'd basically at the very end, you would before you tell the outside world, "Hey guys, we're ba we're, we're back in business, start running." You'd make sure you flush all these guys out too. It's additional bookkeeping. Does DPT get flushed to disk? Like, like no, not the, yet, right? the, the actual table or what the pages that are in? When, so under Aries, what you're supposed to do is at the moment that the, before you tell the outside world, okay, we're, we've fully recovered, we can start running again, you're supposed to flush all the dirty pages out to disk. I don't think people actually do that though. Because like, okay, if you assume crashes are rare, then like why spend the time to flush these things out? I'll just, you know, I'll just, they'll get flushed out during normal operations anyway. To, to the next checkpoint or, or background writer. Sorry, and then I have another question. That I, <clears throat> well, I don't quite get how you know what undo makes. How, how do you know, like, for example, 970, I see 70, but undo 60, right? How do you know the next, the next thing undo is going to be? Like, where are you getting that information? Because it would be, the, again, it's the pre LSN that you would have, like. Oh, you're sorry. Not, yeah, like, I, says, I, need, I should be more consistent. I'm showing the different variations of, of the log records because it's. You don't have to put all in, but like you would have the previous LSN to say, here's the previous LSN for this, and then that's what it is. Same thing. Okay, any other questions?
again, this is hard. This is why like you don't want you don't want randos voting database systems. You want CMU students. Okay. So some quick again, these are just reiterating everything I said before. So what happens if we crash during during the analysis phase? What do we need to do? Nothing. We just run a recovery again because we didn't do any updates during the analysis. What happens if we crash during during the redo phase? Do we need to be clever at editing? No. Just come back and just redo everything just, just as normal before, right? So what can we do to make re redo go faster? So we assume that we're not going to crash crash again. That we don't need to flush disk immediately. The flush the pages in disk immediately at every single step as we go along. We'll just do this either all the, all at the end later on or just when we when we turn turn the system back on as I already said. To make undo go faster, we could potentially maintain a log of the 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 changes we need to reverse for pages in memory so that when a transaction then tries to read that page, then we go ahead and actually apply it before we serve it up. Uh, I don't think any system actually does this. You, you could actually, it's one optimization you could do. Or you could just rewrite your application, remove long running transactions, because then that'll minimize how far back in the log you have to go to, to undo things. But that's asking people to change application code and nobody's gonna do that. All right, so we, we've gone through this. And so was, hopefully, you know, you, you'll absorb some of this and everything will be on, you know, we, you can watch it again later on YouTube. Um, so the main idea is, again, in Aries, we have the write-ahead log, we steal no force, we use these fuzzy checkpoints to keep a snapshot of the dirty page IDs and actual transactions. We're gonna redo, redo everything uh, on recovery to get us back to the, the earliest dirty page. And then we're gonna undo any transaction that was still active at the moment of the crash. And then we're we'll use these compensation log records to keep track of here's the changes we, 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 we've undone. So we know that we, we've actually, we've actually uh, applied them. And the thing we're gonna to use to keep track of like what, is, what comes before what is through these log sequence numbers. That's gonna allow us to then do, you know, make sure we apply the changes in either reverse or forward direction in, in the proper order. And we we'll use the just LSNs all throughout the system to keep track of what's, what's actually durable on disk. And again, this goes back to that diagram I showed before where there's like, here's the different layers of the system that we're building up. And then there was this concurrent control piece and then the recovery piece that would sort of again span all of them. Because this is why, again, the, the, this notion of like these LSNs are all throughout the, the, the entire system. Yes? The statement is the CLRs are handle the worst case where you keep crashing during, during, re during recovery, yes. All right, well, congratulations. At this point in the semester, you know how to build a single node database system, right? All right that was a groan, I heard that. Uh, so, so now, starting uh, this Thursday, uh, we can start talking about distributed databases. And it's all the same we talked about the entire semester, just now harder. All right, good. All right, guys, hit it. They ain't cold, it's taking its toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a duck, show some love. Three for 50, is you with me what I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snakes.